Um, so I'll be talking about security in the ZK domain. Uh, so let me firstly just say a couple of words about Veridice. I'm a research scientist as Ver at Veridice. Uh, Veridice is a blockchain security company doing audits, uh, focusing mainly on the ZK domain, but also quite more broadly. And our team comes from a more academic background, more from formal verification. Hence, we do also a lot of tooling, and the development of tooling goes hand in hand with our audits. Sometimes we kind of use the experiences from audits to kind of feedback to the development of tools and so on. So today, I want to talk about various tools that you might use in the ZK domain that are kind of useful, particularly in the ZK domain, to kind of um, catch some bugs, and I don't think I have to really uh, detail too much why it is important to catch those bugs. You, we know all those big uh, events that happened. Um, so today I will particularly concentrate on one part uh, of our tooling, which is mainly using SMT solvers. And I'll try to explain how you can, for instance, automatically detect under constraint circuits using uh, these um, uh, SMT solvers. And uh, I mean, it will look a bit technical. I don't really want to dive too much into technicalities, but if at the end of the day I can convince you that SMT solvers are a great thing and if you share my enthusiasm about uh, uh, SMT solvers at the end, I think that, that it will have been a good talk. Okay, so I'll talk about under constraint circuits, but of course you can do the same thing for many other kinds of bugs that you might be hunting for. Um, so just very shortly about the ZK workflow, I mean, as everyone knows, you just write a source code with a domain-specific language, circum, halo2, whatever, and then, uh, as opposed to normal programming, you will have two, two components, right? You will have the witness generator, which will, which will kind of be just the usual running of the program, as you would know in some sense, but then there would be also the generation of the constraints, right? And then from the constraints, you will construct a prover and the corresponding verifier, and you want this to be succinct and you might want some zero knowledge properties and so on, yeah? So, but the upshot is your source code will consist of two parts, computation and constraints, and you want these to be kind of uh, equivalent, yeah? I'll talk more about it in a bit, what I mean by this equivalency. So just, oops, I went a bit too far. Okay, so just um, a very simple example. This would be, for instance, a very simple uh, circum circuit that does something not too interesting, it has two inputs, two outputs, and one of the output is the uh, quotient of the two inputs, the other is the sum, right? And uh, of course, because of the structure of the proving systems, you have to be a bit careful, like the first one would be just a computation, the first line would just compute A divided by B, but you can't really co tr tr transform this directly into a constraints because division you cannot really express so nicely. So rather than that, you would express it in terms of multiplication, right? Because of the structure of the proving systems. So the first one would be a computation, the other one would be a com uh, constraint. The last one is just a usual addition, which also fits nicely with the structure of the constraints. So you can do the computation and the constraints at the same time. Right, so you basically would have your computation that would consist of the division and the addition and the corresponding constraints that would be just the addition and the multiplication. And you want that the computation that you have and the constraints that you generate should be equivalent. Yeah, so, um, so the computation you can think of, you have an input-output pair and you want to have a corresponding set of constraints which in general will be polynomial equations and you want that the two are kind of, uh, the, the constraints reflect very nicely uh, your computation, right? So you want that if something is a true computation, it should pass all the, con it should satisfy all the constraints and nothing else should satisfy the constraints, right? And one of the bugs that can happen is that you don't put enough constraints, right? This would be kind of what we call an under-constraint circuit and it would correspond to the case where you have an input-output pair which is not really an input-output pair. So there is a x, y, such that f of x is not equal to y, but x comma y still satisfies all the constraints, right? And this will, in general, be a source of a bug, right? Okay, and we want that this does not happen. So the 
computation and the equations should be equivalent, so the, uh, you should have a computation if, an if the constraints are satisfied. And uh, how would you detect that automatically, right? Uh, because the, your, the computations might be quite long, the constraints will be quite complicated, how do you check this equivalence, right? And we want to do it in an automated way, so there are various tools to do that, and we have at Veridice, we develop a whole hierarchy of different tools from the most simplest ones to the most um, complicated ones, and all have their pros and cons, right? You can have fuzzers, you can have static analysis, analysis tools, and you can use formal methods and uh, formal verification. Uh, so today I'll be talking about SMT-based reasoning, and the idea is basically you want to kind of construct this under constraintness that you want to detect, you translate it into a formula in first order logic. Yeah? So you're basically asking whether this statement over here is satisfiable. Can I find x, y1, y2 such that this holds, right? This would mean that there is an input x and two different outputs, y1 and y2, which are different from each other, but they both together with the input x pass all the constraints. This should in general not happen. Yeah? And you see, I've rephrased everything so that the computation itself, the function f does not appear here. I express everything just in terms of the constraints. Right? So that's kind of, uh, we'll be just concentrating on the constraints. And you're asking whether this logical formula is satisfiable. And the moment you talk about satisfiability, that will probably remind you of the Boolean satisfiability problem that you might have seen in your college years. So basically in the Boolean satisfiability problem, you have a logical formula, which would be just some logical variables together with some and or not and so on. And you ask whether this, there is a um, valid interpretation for this. So is there an assignment of truth values to the variables that makes the whole statement true? Yeah, in this case, p false, q false, r true would be a valid assignment that gives you true at the end. And in general, to decide whether a given logical formula is satisfiable or not is a difficult problem. It's known to be MP complete, uh, but there are ways to uh, do that. Yeah? So there are what are called uh, SAT solvers that kind of uh, deal with this problem. Yeah? But in our case, um, our constraints were polynomial equations over a finite field. So we don't only work with truth values, we also work with additions, multiplications, field elements, constants, and so on. Yeah? So just the normal SAT solver will not suffice, so that's why, why we use uh, SMT solvers. So SMT stands for Satisfiability Modular Theories, and the idea is basically you take a normal SAT solver, but you add on it an additional theory. Yeah? This could be, for instance, the theory of integers, the theory of real numbers, or in our case, it will be the theory of a finite field. And then you can reason in that theory. Yeah? And then you can ask questions like, is this formula in this uh, theory satisfiable or not? Yeah? And uh, so what would S a, a, a SMT solvers give you? So you would supply it with the first order logic formula over a given background theory T. In our case, it would be the theory of finite fields. And it would output to you either that it is unsatisfiable or it would tell you it is satisfiable and it will give you a model for it, right? Okay, just to give you an impression of what the possible theories could look like, you could have, for instance, the theory of the integers with just addition. Yeah? This is also known as Pressburger arithmetic, so it would be linear integer arithmetic. This is a quite simple theory. It is complete and decidable. Yeah? And um, you have quantifier and elimination, but it is not very expressive, for instance. Right? So you cannot talk about divisibility. You cannot talk about prime numbers. You have no nonlinear equations and so on. If you add these, if you add multiplication, you would get a theory that is incomplete and undecidable, which is also not nice because it's not anymore true that any statement um, has a proof in this theory or its negation has a proof. And given a given statement, you cannot algorithmically decide uh, whether uh, it is um, satisfiable or not. Yeah? So these are the basic uh, um, results from uh, logic, right? Uh, 
Okay, um, just to give you some more visual examples, you could look, for instance, at the linear real arithmetic. This would be complete and decidable and methods. This would kind of translate into simplex methods and fourier motzkin elimination, that kind of theory. And what's very surprising maybe is if you look at nonlinear real arithmetic, so if you have the real numbers together with addition and multiplication, Unlike the case of the integers, it will be a theory that's complete and decidable. Yeah, it's a result by Tarski. And the nice thing is you, you even have something called quantifier elimination. Yeah, so given a statement in this theory, you can, if it has certain quantifiers, you can obtain a corresponding statement in the same theory which does not have quantifiers so that one of them is satisfiable if and only if the other is not satisfiable. Yeah, so just to give you a list of possible theories that are, for instance, su supported by CVC-5, it's quite long, so you see it's a very rich world. It's lots of space to experiment with SMT solvers. Let me just give you some nice examples just to share the enthusiasm about SMT solvers. So you would, in this case, you would, for instance, look at these three constraints. You're looking for a real number, so this would be over the theory of reals. You look for a real number, which is inside the red circle on the blue curve such that the x and y coordinates are different. Yeah? So the SMT solver has a certain syntax. You enter everything in that syntax. You run the SMT solver, and it returns that it is satisfiable, and one model, so one satisfying assignment would be x is minus 1 half, y is equal to minus 2, for instance. The really nice thing is that you have, in fact, quantifier elimination which would mean you, that you can, for instance, give a statement that has a quantifier, right? So you say there exists an x such that ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero, right? And quantifier elimination means that from this you can obtain a new formula without quantifiers uh, that is satisfiable if and only if this is satisfiable. Yeah? So if you run it through the SMT solver, you see that the outcome would be this uh, formula that you know for the discriminant that you already know from high school, right? You look at the discriminant of this quadratic polynomial, b squared minus 4ac, and the SMT solver would tell you, it would discover for you what the discriminant is, and it would tell you, okay, if the discriminant is non-negative, then this is satisfiable, or if a is zero, so if you have a linear equation, or if you have a constant which is zero in the end, yeah? Okay, but in our case, uh, we'll be more interested in the theory of finite fields, and uh, we want to work with uh, some, um, uh, we want to kind of decide in, within the theory of finite fields. Um, so let me just compare with other methods. I mean, you could use static analysis tools, which are very fast and very scalable, but they would give you many false positives, right? They would always bug you, oh, here there could be a bug, here there could be a bug, and so on. You would be overwhelmed with those. Whereas on the other hand, if you use the SMT solver, you'd, it would be very precise, but it will be very un, not scalable. Yeah, that would be uh, a problem. So what we have done is basically we developed a tool that uh, kind of uses the nice thing of both sides to some extent. So we. Uh, use both the strength of static analysis, so it's fast, and also the rigorousness of a SMT solver. So I want, to, so the tool is called PyCus, it's open source, you can access it, you can just experiment with it if you want. What it does is basically, I won't go too much into the detail, but it's basically an interactive loop between a SMT solver and the static analysis tool so that they go hand in hand. So whenever the SMT solver gets stuck somewhere, it feeds the result that it has, the partial results to the static analysis tool, which kind of will help the SMT solver and so on. Yeah? And you can see that with such an approach, you can already push the boundaries of what you can do quite far. Yeah? Um, so I won't go into the details, but the problem is, um, at some point, even with the help of the static analysis, you still run into problems, yeah? Because the SMT solver will be basically your constraints are polynomial equations over potentially very large finite fields with many, many equations. So this is an inherently difficult problem that has been um, kind of in the minds of people in computer algebra for many years. And because it's a difficult problem, 
course, you expect that the SMT solver will also run into problems at some point, and that's what happens because basically uh, everything boils down to either some triangulation methods within the SMT solver or some Krivner basis computations, which are doubly exponential and so on. Yeah? Okay, so there's no hope in waiting that there will be new results uh, helping you with this because uh, people have been working on solving polynomial equations for many, many decades, and this is where we are, right? But what we can do is, in fact, um, we can say we are in a domain where the constraints that we have have a very special form, right? There are kind of constraints coming from uh, like some arithmetization of some circuit that you have, and then you can try to exploit that. And yeah, that was our next step. Once uh, the help of the static analysis is not enough, we decided, okay, let's look at the structure of the constraints that we have, and they tend to be very sparse, right? The polynomial equations that are involved in most cases have very few variables and they have low degrees. If they come from R1CS constraints, they will have degree at most two, for instance, and so on. And then the question is, can we exploit that? And to do that, you really have to understand the structure of the corresponding set of constraints. And what we did for that is basically to attach a given graph to the given set of constraints. So you basically want to see how the variables are related with each other. So you basically create a graph where the vertices correspond to the variables and you draw an edge between two vertices whenever the two variables corresponding to the two vertices appear together in a given equation, right? So for instance, the FP multiply circuit uh, from the circumparing library, which has 377 variables, 392 equations would give you such a graph, right? Quite complicated. You can get rid of the multiple edges, then you see it has a bit more structure, so you'll see many arms appearing, right? And then you might wonder, oh, what do these arms really correspond to? Uh, you, if you look closer at this, I mean, you want to understand the topology of this, where do these arms correspond to? Can I deal with them separately, and so on? You ask those sorts of questions and uh, you can somehow use some methods from graph theory about block cut trees and so on. And once you do that, uh, you see that, for instance, a given graph will correspond to um, uh, a constraint of the form as follows. It just says that x is equal to such a polynomial where all the bi's are either zero or one, right? And this would basically say the bi's are zero or one, and x is just given by a base two uh, expansion, right? And it it's just says that x lies between zero and two to the k plus one, where k is uh, the number of variables that you have, right? So you see, in fact, such a complicated arm corresponds to a very simple inequality. But the problem is once you want to express that very simple inequality in terms of polynomials, you end up in very complicated systems that are difficult to handle by the polynomial uh, algebra, right? So basically such an inequality that where you say that x is between zero and two to the 13 plus one would give you a polynomial of degree 16,000 roughly, yeah? It just says x is either zero or it is one or it is two and so on and it's no surprise that the SMT solver has problems with it. So then the next step was, okay, why overload the SMT solver with all those difficult queries. What we can do instead is if we have some uh, separate range analysis for, and we treat bits some separately in a different way, then uh, together uh, with this cooperative reasoning between the Krupner basis module and the module for bit sums and range analysis, one can speed up things even more and one can kind of uh, verify really large circuits. Yeah? So, um, I want to stop here, uh, but I hope I could just convey to you our enthusiasm about uh, SMT solvers, formal methods, and uh, to show you just that um, there is some uh, very deep theory that is waiting there to be exploited to come up with really nice tools to automate the process of finding bugs. Thank you. Thank you, Al.